hey guys happy sunday and welcome back to my channel manicure and murder combos if you are new here my name is yari and if not welcome back and thank you for joining me once again today we'll be talking about serial killer nathaniel white and we will also chat about nail polishes so grab yourself a snack or your manicure kit or both as you know we pass no judgments here and let's get started funny thing yesterday i went to middletown to hang out a bit which is a little crazy because many of Nathaniel White's crimes were committed in Middletown, New York. But he was not the reason for my visit. I had something personal to do with my husband. And then we went to spend some time with some family. I then also had a great idea for a future video. So I took advantage and grabbed a few items for this future video to make it happen. But anyway, obviously a few things happened during this visit, but it like I said, it sparked a video also for today's video to talk about. And one of the things that I purchased was a few bottles of nail polish. So while I grabbed a few bottles, I, know, I started thinking about when watching people swatch nail polishes, I feel tempted and almost obligated to purchase all the colors that come out seasonal. Um, so for example, I have a few a variety of like let's say a reds when i buy polishes i tend not to buy just exactly the same color i buy different shades i do notice that when seasonal colors do come out obviously sometimes i will get some and other times i won't because the colors that i already have are extremely close in color that when i apply it no one will be able to tell what color i put on so for that reason, I wanted to mention that when you're buying nail polish, don't feel obligated to get every single color that's out there. You'll end up with basically a bedroom or a store of nail polishes. I have 200 bottles of nail polish, about 200 pop, um, bottles. However, I just don't feel I need 10,000 bottles. And I don't know, I just don't think it's necessary. So. That's basically the tip I want to give today. Get yourself a variety of colors, but don't feel obligated to get every single color that comes out unless you really like it and want it. So anyway, moving along. So Nathaniel White was born on July 28, 1960. He was raised in New York City. He was one of five children. Both his parents were factory workers and they made the decision to move their family to Poughkeepsie, New York in the early 1970s. There isn't too much background information on Nathaniel White, but it is rumored that he did have a good relationship with his parents and that he was a, de a decent student and never presented to be a problem child, nor at home, nor at school. Um, they say that he played basketball. The only dark side of Nathaniel's life was that is it, he said that he was once molested by a babysitter but however no one ever filed a claim against the babysitter no one said anything other than that it's just i don't know if it's a speculation or he's admitted this to somebody but that is the only thing that came up that i see was damaging in his life so anyway, he graduated from Poughkeepsie High School in 1979 and then joined the United States Army. He was discharged in 1983. I don't know if it was honorable or non-honorable. I really don't know, but he was discharged in 1983. He did move to Maryland and he ends up marrying a woman named Wanda. For whatever reason unknown to me, that marriage was short-lived and only they only made it 18 months together. After his marriage dissolved, he moved back to New York and was with another woman named Jill Garrison in 1986, and she had two daughters from a previous relationship. Jill's parents were not fond of Nathaniel, but there was nothing they could do to keep her grown to keep their grown daughter away from him. But they felt that the that the reason that they didn't like him it wasn't that he wasn't smart or anything, but he had a way almost like a gift to get what he wanted from people and that particular trait didn't sit well with jill's parents so anyway jill was interviewed and she stated that nathaniel at first was very charming nice and also a very clean person he helped maintain like the cleanliness of their living space 
that they shared together. She stated that Nathaniel was also very attentive of her, like so much so that he would even help her like clean her nursing uniforms. So basically he was attentive of her. Jill stated that there was nothing that ever caused her any alarm until one day, Nathaniel started drinking heavily, then he started to physically abuse her by hitting her and choking her. Um, Jill also stated that after drinking, it was difficult for Nathaniel to maintain employment and he would spend a lot of time watching action movies. Jill had a brother and he was also interviewed and in the and he was documented to say that Nathaniel was a charmer and he would share his dislike for women and occasionally stated what he wanted to do to women which obviously weren't good things. I don't know if Jill's brother ever shared those conversations with Jill. And if he did, I don't know if she believed him, you know, because obviously this guy was a nice guy. So anyway, in 1986, due to Nathaniel's inability to maintain a job, Jill complained about their financial situation. Nathaniel, instead of giving special consideration to looking for real employment, he made the decision to go rob a convenience store to better their financial situation. He immediately learned that that was a horrible decision because he was caught and he did plead guilty to the robbery of the convenience store and was sentenced to three to nine years, though he didn't have a criminal, a prior criminal record. Um, is also documented that Nathaniel during that time was a well-behaved inmate and caused little to no problems during his incarceration. Nathaniel was then released in 1989 on parole and he went back to live with Jill. Jill felt that the time that Nathaniel spent in jail was her fault because she had complained to Nathaniel about their finances. Obviously, I don't personally think it's her fault, you know, as people have a right to express how they feel. And Nathaniel's reaction was just honestly his his own free will. He decided to rob this convenience store and she shouldn't have taken it as her own fault. But anyway, in 1990, Nathaniel was again arrested for assault and for resisting arrest, but the parole board was not notified. Therefore, Nathaniel was let go with a simple fine. Then on March 25th, 1991, Nathaniel picked up pregnant 29-year-old single mother, Juliana Frank, who was Jill's friend and took her to Middletown, New York, near an abandoned railroad track, and they drank beer together. In the, um, at some point, Nathaniel decided to kill her and left her body on the abandoned tracks that they were obviously hanging out at. And for some unknown reason, Nathaniel decided to murder her. And the next day, her body was found neatly posed by some joggers. Her body was beaten up, stabbed numerous times. Her throat was slit. And she had a cut that started from her chest area and ended in her abdominal area. It was initially speculated that Juliana might have been killed by more than one person due to the severity of her inflicted injuries. Um, interesting note, yesterday while I was hanging out in Middletown, I did pass by that abandoned railroad. Obviously, I didn't get out my vehicle to go walk through this space, but even, you know, it doesn't look scary in the daylight, but still, I wasn't going to go into these tracks, but I did see them. So anyway, um, then on April 17, 1991, Nathaniel was once again arrested for attempted kidnapping and an assault of a 16-year-old girl that had managed to escape. Of course, because people don't see the severity of a situation unless it impacts their life. And it was, and with that said, the prosecutors agreed to lower the charges to unlawful imprisonment. That is, if Nathaniel agreed to plead guilty to those to that charge. And of course, Nathaniel agreed, especially when the consequences of his actions was only would only require him to pay a fine and to serve a short sentence of nine months in prison and given an additional three months for violating his parole. Basically, a slap on the wrist. And on April 23rd, 1992, he was released again on parole and returned to live with Jill, who shared that this time around, Nathaniel was no longer a man that she knew. He was more abusive, drank more than before, and even introduced a new bad behavior to their relationship by stepping out the house without any mention to where he was going at nighttime. Prior to Nathaniel's release on April 1992, someone had made a notification to social services on Nathaniel for his violent behavior, which prompted a judge to apply an order of protection against Nathaniel to stay away from Jill, her home, and her children. Unfortunately for Jill, in the order, 
To assure that Nathaniel stood away from her children, the order also speculated that Jill's children will have to be removed and placed to live with their father. And on May 1992, social services filed a formal complaint against Nathaniel. Not long after that, Christine Marie Kebel, 14-year-old, who was Jill's niece, who often came over the house to visit and play with her cousins, shared with her father that Nathaniel had touched her inappropriately, which basically ignited her father to put a stop to her visit to Jill's house. Without doubt, Nathaniel denied these allegations, claiming that Christine took an innocent touch the wrong way. But not too soon after her allegations, on June 19, 29, 1992, June 9, June 29, 1992, Christine went missing, which led to many people going out to search for her. And in this group, of course, as we know, Nathaniel was included. Then on July 10, 1992, Lorette Huggins Viria, 34-year-old, who was also a friend to Nathaniel's girlfriend, Jill, was found strangled and stabbed over 30 times about her body in her home in Middletown. She was a mother of three children and worked as a, no as a nurse and sat part was that Loretta had made plans to relocate prior to her death and she had been packing little by little and of course Nathaniel had helped her pack some of those belongings. Jill had made mention in some reports that Nathaniel will share with her that he was concerned as to what would happen to Laureate's kids now that she was dead. Then on July 20, 1992, Angelina Hopkins, 23, and Brenda Whiteside, 20, had gone out to hang out in Poughkeepsie at a bar called the Blue Note Tavern with Angelina's sister named Cecilia. At some point during the night, Angelina and Brenda made a decision to leave the bar with a couple of men they had sh that had only shared their nicknames with the girls. While Cecilia decided against it, and good thing because that would be the last time Angelina and Brenda would be seen alive. The next day, Cecilia and her mother went to the Poughkeepsie Police Department to file a missing persons report for both Angelina and Brenda. They also provided law enforcement with the nicknames of the men of the names that the men had used. However, the police advised them that they needed more information to proceed with the case and told them when they find out more information to come back and share it with them, prompting Cecilia and her mother, Teresa Hopkins, to visit the tavern bar every night after and spoke to patrons of the bar, hoping to find something that will help with the disappearance of Angelina and Brenda. Then on July 30th, Nathaniel was fired from his packing job, and on that same day, the stabbed body of Adrian Hunter, 27-year-old, was found in Middletown, New York. After the body of Adrian Hunter was found, the local police then started putting a pattern together and requested that the New York State Police assist them with the homicide pattern. In total, four departments came together to assist with the case. There was very little evidence to go on and barely any witnesses besides Cecilia Hopkins, the sister of Angelina, who had refused to go with the men at the bar. Then on August 2nd, 1992, Cecilia gets a call from a friend that one of the men that Angelina and Brenda had left with was present at the bar, which led both Cecilia and her mother to rush to the bar to confirm what the friend had said. Nathaniel was confronted by Cecilia and Teresa. Nathaniel went on to admit that he had left both Angelina and Brenda, but that soon after he dropped them off at the train station. He said he became afraid at the thought of having to share that he was with the girls to the police because he didn't want them to suspect him of something he didn't do, but then offered to help them with anything they needed. So basically he's like, I knew I should have came forward with this information. However, I didn't want to be a suspect, so I didn't, but hey, here I am to help you now if you do need anything. Yeah, whatever. So anyway, Cecilia, of course, didn't buy his story and she provided the police with the information that Nathaniel had given her. She even included the license plates of the vehicle that he was op that he was operating at the time of course the police you know having no other information and not many leads to go on to go with they checked the information that cecilia had provided to them and they were able to gather that nathaniel did have criminal history and they and you know he they now they have a viable suspect they were also able to learn that the car that nathaniel was operating was stolen and obviously that is because the stolen vehicle had been reported. 
So anyway, on August 3rd, 1992, Nathaniel was arrested for the stolen vehicle and was questioned. During the interrogation, Nathaniel confessed to the murders and told them where they could find the buried bodies of both Angelina and Brenda, which was the same location that Adrian's body had been found on July 30th. During that time, he also confessed to all the murders he committed, which totaled the five women and the one 14-year-old girl, Christine. He also claimed that his appetite to kill was sparked after he watched the Robocop movie in 1991 and that while he consumed alcohol, he would hear a voice in his head that told him to go out and find women and kill them. Nathaniel shared that his overkill on Juliana's body was because he was mimicking a scene from the Robocop movie that he had seen. He, he then also led police to the remains of Christina, the 14-year-old that he had claimed that he was trying to help and that he didn't touch her or anything, that basically she was crazy. Well, she was dumped a few miles away from the bodies of Angelina, Brenda, and Adrian. Um, what I find odd here is that we never find out who was the other man that had left with Angelina and Brenda. He was never mentioned again, so maybe they all hung out for a little while then maybe nathaniel said hey i'll drop them off at the train station or yeah i don't know something was said that this other person was no longer with them because he is not mentioned at all so i don't think that the other guy at all was involved in these murders because i do feel nathaniel will have said something since he was so open about the other murders that he had committed but anyway on Going back on August 7, 1992, Nathaniel was indicted for the murder of Christine, which was the 14 year old girl. And then on September 9th, 1992, the other murders were added to that indictment. He pleaded not guilty to the reason of insanity, but he was um, but he was also found guilty and convicted on April 14, 1993 and sentenced to 150 years to life and is currently serving his sentence in Elmira Correctional Facility. Nathaniel's case was cited by New York Governor George Pataki in defense to his push to reinstate the death penalty. However, New York State still today does not carry out the death penalty. Unfortunately, today, police departments still do not communicate well. Hell, they barely communicate well within their own departments. Um, yes, the communication between the police departments have improved. However, one would think that in 2021, the communication would better. But I guess some things take a long time, I guess. I don't know. But I think in order for police departments to correct their lack of communication with other police departments they should really try to communicate well within themselves and i'm sure that would fix whatever lack of communications they do have but i hope you guys love this color i you know i'm done with the murder i hope you enjoyed it but i hope you love the color i love it i love the simple designs and I hope you, like I said, I hope you enjoyed it. Well, my loves, that is all I have for you for today. I hope you enjoyed and have fun doing manis together. And as I say, you say no to murderers, but yes to murder stories. And I will definitely catch you guys next week, Sunday. And I will be putting a new video for you together soon. And I, like I said, catch you next Sunday. Bye.